Hello, I'm J.D. King, International Director of World Revival Network of Ministries, and I'm really excited to get to sit down with Pastor Steve Gray, hear him talk about his understanding of you know, reading the Bible, interpreting it, and I know we're going to get a lot of really outstanding insights today as we sit down and have this conversation. Pastor Steve, thanks for sitting down with thanks. me. Thanks. This ought to be fun, and I hope it's enlightening and helps people you know, want to read their Bible and get more out of it. That's my hope. That's good. Let's kind of start with maybe a little easy question here. Um, what's your favorite book of the Bible? Well, J.D., it's not going to come as a surprise to you that the book of Luke is my favorite book of the Bible. But, you know, I go all of them. I love them all, and I love the Old Testament, New Testament. I love it all. But uh, Luke has always had a special place because I think of what he's trying to accomplish, what he's trying to do in his day. So, you know, he ha he's up against a lot of the same things we are, I think, a, a church that historically has been empowered by the Holy Spirit and then uh, now is losing that power, but not just losing the power uh, on the higher end, but the general everyday folks that used to flow in the Spirit and start the fire burning in the churches. That flame is going out and it's shifting over to clergy and professionalism somewhat. So he digs in and writes the book to say, I need to find a way to explain to these people that what Jesus did was not because he's Jesus, but he did it by the power of the Holy Spirit, and we're supposed to do it too. And so he starts with actually the day of Pentecost, I think, and starts writing backwards to his beginning because that's where he wants to get people, and then after that. So it just applies. We're in a society that... We have the general empowerment of the general church is not where it needs to be. And so that's why I like it so much, because I really want to see the people empowered. I don't like the division between clergy and people so much. I don't like a double standard. I don't like a height or a space between the platform and the people. And so it's just a great book to get ordinary people, outcasts, hurting, all the people that would disqualify themselves and, and become an audience. This is the book to get them to join in and go. So that's why I like it. It's kind of fun to hear, you know, not only the book you like, but why you like yeah. it. Yeah. That's, that's a it's, great insight. And it's really needed, you know, today. Yeah. I, I love that. Well, let's kind of keep going here with some more questions here. But, um, you know, the Bible, there's a lot in it. There's all these different ideas and stories and people. And I kind of want to start getting, you know, picking your brain here and maybe asking you some questions, what you understand about it. And I know there's a lot of people really, you know, they're saying, hey, I want to know more about the Word. And, but could you help us understand what are some key patterns of thinking that undergird Scripture, you know, that kind of that shape its meaning? You know, what are some big picture things that you've discovered? And I know you, you already know this. And you've discovered this already for yourself, but probably as you go through this, the biggest thing that hits me when I read the Bible is I'm reading a book that's based on a previous agreement or covenant. It's a covenant book. And if you read it out of context of the covenant, then it's just loose ends. And you don't know where to begin or where to start. But if you realize this whole thing starts with an agreement and covenants, and God has come down. That's the other thing, I guess, is it's a book where God comes down to talk with people, and he makes agreements with people. Then we read the story of the Bible of how did God fulfill his agreement? How did he respond to the people as they fulfilled or did not fulfill their agreement? Much of the Bible really is about God trying to keep his agreement up while people are not keeping their agreement up. Yeah. And it's particularly important to, to color that in your thinking because we live in a covenantlessness society, so to speak, where covenant is very weak, marriages are weak, agreements are weak, a handshake means nothing, people's word means nothing. And here we go into a book where God's trying to keep his word, and he's trying to get the people to keep their word and have integrity of the word on both sides. So that's probably the yeah. biggest thing is to not read it as a one-sided covenant where God's just handing out, but God came down and, you know, sort of spiritually shook hands with us yeah. and made a deal. And if you read it that way, it, it, I think yeah. there's so many principles to it, but that's a big one to me is reading it as I'm part of this covenant. I'm part of the deal. So this book is, is a teaching, but it's also for me, as you know, it's a book of clues. I look at our symptoms and circumstances then I read the Bible and try to find where's the clue to where we may not be fulfilling our portion, 
that might kick in if we started doing that. So, you know, a lot of my sermons are, we could, we should start doing this or that, or this, this is our part of the deal, yeah. uh, keeping us responsible. But if you don't think in terms of covenant, then you read the Bible like uh, as a personal inspiration book or something like that, which it is, but it loses its punch, I think. I think I heard a couple other things in your, your, your talk there. Uh, I heard a little bit of maybe about community, about relationships, and maybe even an implied idea of kingdom. Were there, were there some big themes you think that are in Scripture? You know, yeah, um, you, you've heard me say this before. Yeah, the covenant is one. The other is what direction is everything going? And modern religion, as you know, and we've talked about many times, has now shifted away from earth and getting everybody into heaven. I think it's a ploy because it gets the the people off of what's really going on. There's no expectation. You don't feel like, well, we're supposed to be like Luke, the empowered people of God by the Holy Spirit. You think, well, I'm here maintaining, holding ground, doing the best I can until I finally leave. So I'm going somewhere. So covenant, then God comes down, and so it happens here, and he establishes his kingdom. And that's why we're here. We are here to show that eventually a kingdom is coming, and we need to adjust our lives early before it gets here. That's where we give glory to God. And then, of course, then we're the community people. We're the people of God. We're not individuals anymore. The idea of getting into Christianity is to get into the body of Christ where now you fit in, but you're not individually thinking. You are individually contributing, but you're not individually thinking. You're contributing for the better of the group, which is a very Middle Eastern or Eastern concept. It's not a very American uh, Western concept. Yeah, That'll help you a lot. If you think, read the Bible as a covenant, community, group, and as the direction is, everything's coming down because God's trying to make His point down here, not up there. Yeah. Well, that's quite a bit to chew on right yeah, there. Yeah, no, just that. No, no, which, which I'm glad. I mean, that's what we're wanting to to touch on. Let me kind of take this same conversation. In fact, it may be a different way of asking the same question, but I, I like this question. How do you think the Apostle Paul approached the Scriptures? You know, what what was he thinking? Yeah, as he was writing or reading scripture, what, what was going on? Well, he's a very deep person, but I, if you take it on a shallow end for just a second, I like Paul because when you read Paul, Paul's not trying to get out of something. He's trying to get into something. And that's, again, direction. You read, people are trying to do the Bible, but they're trying to get away as much as they can. Paul's trying to get in, even to the point of death. He wants to know Christ and the power of the resurrection whatever it takes. He wants to understand his sufferings, the high, the low. He wants to know everything. So he's trying to get into everything Jesus went through and was and is, he wants to be. So that's the first. It's his direction, just really going at it. And you don't meet very many people that are going at it. Most people are trying to live on the edge and see how little they can do. Paul was, I mean, I've been crucified with Christ. I don't even want to live anymore. I want to be uh, in him. So that's the first part. And then, of course, the second part is what is being has been discovered and called the new perspective is we're discovering, guess what? Paul was Jewish. He's always been Jewish, and he's approaching it as a Jew, uh, even towards the Gentiles. He's not leaving his Judaism behind. He's trying to figure out how do I minister as a Jew to non-Jews, and what is their inheritance in Judaism, and how much do I give him? How much do I not give him? But he's a Jew. And uh, probably, as you know, E.P. Sanders probably did the very best to start everybody thinking, uh, which we may talk about some resources later, but everybody thinking, guess what? Jesus is Jewish, Paul's Jewish, and they didn't leave their Jewishness, and Paul did not start a new religion called Christianity. And he saw it as uh, followers of Jesus going the way was part of what had already taken place, yeah. the apostles, the prophets, every what we call Old Testament, Moses, all, everything's built on that, and it was to explode from that. And I see then history coming, and it just stops, and then we start over with a new religion yeah. with a lot of Greek and Hellenistic and yeah. non-Jewish, uh, non-Hebrew attitudes. Yeah, so that's what you're saying is how maybe we differ from Paul now. We're reading entirely different. Like we're seeing rather there being a continuity of the story of Abraham and Moses. We're, you know, we, we say there's a break in it. We're like a new religion, a new people. And you're saying Paul read us as a 
part of the whole people of God or yeah, I think you really can get an eye opener if you realize that it just turned into something it was not supposed to turn into. And that's hard because you know, we want we want our Santa Clauses, Christmas trees, we want our Easter bunnies and we want to mix it all together. But Paul would have had nothing to do with that. He'd just be appalled of the idea of of a Easter bunny or Easter eggs or or, you know, Santa Claus coming to church on Sunday morning or you know, on the Sabbath, he'd just be appalled. He just, he would not, it would not compute. And we're trying to invent a Paul that understands who we are. And you're not going to. I mean, we, I have this strange feeling if Paul came back today, none of us would like him. Exactly. Most people would not like him because he just, he just wouldn't tolerate it. He'd just be, he would be aghast. He'd be writing more books of the Bible at us, you know. So that's the thing. He's Jewish. He's covenant. He's getting in, not trying to get out. Yeah. I want to take some time later on and actually have a more in-depth conversation with you about, about Paul, but it's, I think it's fascinating to ask that question. What was in his mind? What, what might he have been thinking about as he's reading, as he's, because I think sometimes we don't think like that. You know, we're not asking the question, what was in the mind of those in the past? You know, those... Well, and not only personally is he going forth, but he's not, there we talk about corporate. He's going forth with a mindset of, you know, I would, I'd rather lose all this if I could get everybody else to get it. I'd be willing to sacrifice my eternity if I could. I don't think he can, but if he could, yeah. I'd give it all up if everybody else could get it. Yeah. Where's that person? You're just thinking so big, think, thinking I'm a slave to Christ, but I'm a slave to these people, to this movement. Everything is about, if I were there, he, I'd say it's about us. If he were here today, it's about us, in that he lived for the corporate church and he prayed, and he struggled, and like somebody giving birth. I don't know if we comprehend his individual commitment to Jesus, to the movement, and then to the body of Christ. Yeah, that's great. Love, yeah. love hearing that yeah. reflection. He's just so big in that. You know, yeah. He's so big. That's good. Well, kind of the same vein here, and you've already touched on some really outstanding things with Paul's thinking, the kingdom, covenant. What are maybe some other things that people need to know as they're trying to study their Bible? I mean, what are, what are some ideas, some values maybe that ought to be uh, in their mind as they're opening up their Bible? Or... Well, for me, I would like them to realize how, mm, you know, okay, let's not go too far with this and use the word brainwashed, but let's think how we are pre-programmed in our religion, to think that the obvious is what everybody's thinking and the obvious is what is. Uh, so our interpretation of who Jesus is, how he thinks, how Paul thinks, how God reacts, what God will do, what God won't do, is all been colored by a history of only 500 years for most of us as Protestants, 500 years. 1,500 years, especially the first 100 years, and especially the first 100 years, has been totally lost, and we've Americanized and westernized God, Paul, religion. So I have to, myself, I have to watch as I read this that I'm not inventing a God that I'm comfortable with and that looks like me, talks like me, likes what I like, likes the food I like, you know. Uh, and so I have to understand I have the preconceived ideas. And it's preconceived ideas I'm reading that. In other words, the preconceived ideas are going off inside of me before I read even read a verse. So I have to be brave enough to not let my culture, my upbringing be so strong that I'm trying to prove using scripture that I'm what I'm supposed to be or I see this correctly. I'm trying to see through the scriptures how they saw it. And we didn't bring this up, but now would be a good time to do it. We should have probably earlier is, and I first have to understand in context. So my job as a leader is to figure out to the best of my ability, through history and anthropology and commentary and all that stuff, what would a first century Jew think when they read that, as opposed to what do I think? And now I want to tell you what I think. Yeah. Everybody knows what they, you know, everybody everywhere has an opinion on the Bible, but they don't know what their opinion was and what their reaction would be to a story, to a parable, to when you talk about the rich man who died and went to hell. Okay, the, what's, what is that? To us, we said, yeah, rich people ought to go to hell probably. They got all the money. They had it here. Now they shouldn't get it. We're okay with that. What's a Jewish person? Absolutely shocked. Yeah. What? 
Rich people don't go to hell. They're rich because God blessed them. So now it follows through. Totally big, 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 big reaction to them that we don't realize how strong that would have been in their culture. So I have to put myself in their position. Tenant farmers, uh, people that have had their land taken away from them. Think about, think about it, J.D., if you had to go work from sunup to sundown on land that you used to own, used to be your land, they took it away, and then now they make you work it, and they don't give you any of it hardly. They let you have the leftovers, and you have to pay one, two, maybe three times taxes on it. You have to pay Rome. You got to pay the temple tax. You got to pay everybody off. Now, do you think that's going to affect you when you're sitting in your little mud hut at night going, what has happened here? Is where's God? And so Jesus, when he comes in and says, I've got good news for the poor, they have real reason. They lost everything to Rome, unless they were rich landowners or Pharisees like that. Jesus was was particularly good. He had a skill. So if you had a skill, then you didn't just walk around the fields picking up leftovers. So that was pretty good for him. But most people did. So they lost everything. They we forget that Rome is there. We forget that the temple was destroyed. We forget how poor they were, you know, and, and not poor because of they're poor. They're poor because it was taken away from them. Exactly. And they're working their own land and giving the money away. So now put all together. Now read that scripture. Now read your Bible. Now read your New Testament. And realize how do they think? And when it means good news to them, why is it good news to them? I think part of what you're saying here, too, is that we need to get back into the actual story that is there, not, yeah. our, not our own story that we've made up. It's I'm great sure. stories. And, and my my discovery, J.D., has been when I get it, their story enlightened by the Holy Spirit, it applies better, people respond better, they get free better. Their story is better than our story. That's why it's in there. And and so I I love to apply, but you know me. I hold off to the application until I first get uh, to the best you can, what do you think was the response going off inside of them and why? Yeah, kind of in the same vein here. We've talked about, obviously, some positive aspects, you know, kingdom, covenant, context, all these great things to know that should color our own reading. Help me understand a little bit here now. I mean, I know you've touched on it briefly, but what are the issues that you think cause people to struggle with the Bible? You know, they're, they're showing up at church and they're saying, hey, I mean, that they may even listen to your sermons and they go, I like it when I hear you, but if I have to open it up myself, I'm, in, you know, I, I can't, I, I can't figure it out. And they're, and they're seem to be having all these questions and fears. You know, uh, what would you say to them? What, what, what? Why do they struggle? What is the issues that is coloring and causing the confusion today? Well, I think that most of it is another religion has mixed in with Christianity humanism mostly, and I don't know what that means when people hear, what it means to people when they hear that. For me, the practical side of it is you can't overrate uh, the day when Dr. Spock came in, depending on their age, it could be, came into their grandparents, their parents, when Dr. Spock came in, when even though I don't think Sesame Street had that big an impact in our personal life, it colored the way people think they're supposed to think. I don't think in the clinch, I think people go back to selfishness, but in the idealistic thinking, we're all one, we're all loving, we're all, and we're, we're, you know, and they think as far as that, I think people, a really big one, I think people do not know how much Sigmund Freud is in them. The sad part about Freud being a Jewish person who totally corrupted our thinking in making us uh, think in terms of therapy rather than empower empowerment or power that changes us we need to be we need therapy we need to talk it over we need to air our feelings we need to analyze why i feel this way and given some of that might be helpful some of the times we now are going full circle to realize talking it over hasn't done anything what we need is a power encounterment encounter that i don't care why it happened i just glad i don't feel that way anymore and that's the way they did it. But I don't think that we're aware how much Sigmund Freud, Dr. Spock, and humanism has made us think about Christianity. So you come in and you start reading a scripture and you say, the Bible says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. 
People love the scripture. I love that scripture. But the application is they go into conflict because they don't think it can be done. You don't really mean seek first because we're supposed to put our family first and my kids have homework tonight and you're saying I should maybe go to church, be in church in prayer. Maybe I should come to prayer, but I know God really means that I need to not go to prayer. I need to stay home because love means I sit and do my homework with my kids. And if I take them to prayer, then they're going to have to stay up late and we're going to all be sitting up late doing homework. And we know God wouldn't want us to do that. So in other words, there's no, no, you just don't get it because you don't realize, no, God wants you to do that. He wants you to put first, first, and then you pinch yourself when you need to. And you got to stay up and pinch yourself to stay awake. And you pinch your kids, say, I'm sorry, we got to do this. You got a lot of homework, but we're going to do it. But we did the right thing. We're going to put God first and it'll pay off. The payoff is coming, son, because things are coming at us because we're willing to stay up and do this together and say, we're going to prayer. Then we're going to stay up and do your math and I'll do it with you. And God's going to let things are going to come to us. Well, what power? You can feel the anointing when, when I say that. Exactly. You can feel the anointing just come in the room here by saying, we're going to do this. Yeah. But they don't get it. They're thinking of, well, God didn't really mean that because, you know, I'm just afraid I'm going to deprive my kid. And, but then I like the scripture too. We can get all this done. We can do all things. We can do everything. Uh, but you know my life and your life. We're, we're not going to say soccer's evil, you know, so don't play soccer. We're going to say, let's, we can work this out. And if soccer and church hit, then go make a stand for it. Explain, I really don't want to miss this game, but we have a, we, we've we made an agreement with God that we're going to be there, we're going to be this, so I need to be excused, but I'm going to give you all I got when I can be there. People respect that. It puts such strength in it, and you can end up then, maybe you'll miss one game in your lifetime or two. Oh, but the benefits. Oh, yeah. So there's just one example of when you read a scripture and we're just blinded by it. And we could go on, on, you know, I mentioned the other day in church, judge not, lest you be judged. And they stop right there. Totally out. Of course, we have to judge things. The point is not that we don't judge. The point is you realize you are going to choose the measure that you're going to be judged. So if you're really critical of other people, then expect criticism to you. But if you're going to be merciful to other people as you judge, then mercy will come to you. That's what it means. Choose the standard, you know, yeah. uh, that you're going to go with. You know, give and it'll be given unto you. So, like, give good measure, press down. If you're that way, that's going to, men will give back to you. So, everything is so read through Spock and Freud and humanism that we miss it. And we're so, as leaders, in my opinion, we're so concerned that the people are going to stretch themselves, sacrifice, work hard, miss some sleep skip a meal, that we just coddle them because we think God is a coddler. And, you know, uh, I, I do by, I mean, I would by what, I, what I've been taught. But then we read Moses stands up, there's Pharaoh floating by. Well, that's not coddling. And he says, by the way, do you know God is a warrior? Yeah. Well, most people have no idea that. They don't have any idea. They can say God is love, God loves you, God forgives you, but they have no idea God's a warrior. We, I mean, there's hours and hours of discussion yeah. here, but I think, I hope the point is getting Yeah, across. you're hitting it good. Let me hit one other thing here. You know, you're talking about Freud and uh, Spock, and I think underlying a little bit of that is the idea. I think some people read the Bible, maybe, how can I say it this way, maybe through more of a scientific, uh, clinical, therapeutic. I mean, in other words, they don't read the Bible as a story. They don't read it as people, as relationships. They read it like it's uh, scientific theorems, rules, right. magic, incantations, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, and they don't realize that the writers of the Bible were mostly theologians. If they don't like the word theologian, they don't quite know what that means, then just narrow it down and say they're written by pastors. Mm -hmm. They're written by pastors. not by. They're not anti-science, but they're not anti-understanding... You know, uh, uh, all the things of the world and how weather works and all that. No, it's not that. It's that they're not written by people that do that. They're written by people who deal with spiritual things that are not going to do a sidetrack to make sure that you know where dinosaurs came from. You know, they're, they're just, that's not what they do. And we, as a theologian, we are not interested in chronology 
uh, were interested in theology. So Luke did that too a lot. He he knew, I want you to get the spiritual concept, so I'm going to move all the, and Hebrews, a Hebrew mind can do this. I'm going to move all the pieces around so that I make sure at the end of the day you have the spiritual concept. But the Greek-minded people of today, they get all confused because they think, oh, as maybe one you thought ahead of, uh, the Bible contradicts itself. Well, it doesn't contradict itself like that. It's that the two writers are theologians or pastors. So they're not trying to make the pieces fit and the puzzle. They're trying to make you walk away and go, oh, I get it. I know what God, how God thinks about that. If I have to move pieces around and get things out of order, I don't care because I'm not writing a history book. I'm writing a theology book so you can understand God not understand history. And so that throws everybody. And I think what you're saying here too, because like some people get frightened by the word theology, but I think what you're saying is a, is a God story, a God message, a God... I mean, you know, people love movies today, for example. What is it they love about them? Well, I think they love the stories and they don't realize that God is a storyteller yeah. with real stories and, and, the, and as you're saying, the theologians, Luke, whoever, is, is telling a story and they're crafting the story to make sure the impact, you know. Well, you know, with uh, with my daughter Bobby, when she's growing up, I want her to get a spiritual principle. I tell a story of my life, and I put the pieces in that story that I want her to know. But because I leave out something, doesn't mean that I contradicted myself. And then when I tell the story to Kathy, my wife Kathy, I might tell the story differently because I'm going to tell her stuff. I'm not going to tell my daughter about what I did and who I was with and what really happened. But I'm not going to tell my daughter that I'm trying to teach her a spiritual principle. Then my daughter comes up years later and says, you lied to me. You didn't tell me. No, 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 I didn't lie to you. I was being a theologian and a pastor and a father to you. So I pick things out of history that I know will, will get you to get a spiritual principle. When I talk to my wife, sometimes I tell her details because we're going to laugh or enjoy the story. So it's, that's how God does it. And the other thing that people need to realize when they read the Bible, it is a story, and it starts with the story of creation and the story of a man named Adam. It's not the story of Neanderthal. It's not the story of, of did uh, tribal peoples move across from China over to North America, and how does that work, and all that, and, the, and things they dig down, how many million years is it? It's not the story of the million years ago story. Exactly. It's the story of a man that was created in the image of God at a certain time in history and what he did right, what he did wrong, and how God reacted to them. I don't have a book of how God reacted to dinosaurs or Neanderthal or uh, events that people dig up and say, well, this happened. How does the Bible? Well, I don't have a book on that. You might have a book, but I don't have that book. I have a Bible that starts with a man named Adam and how God responded to a man that was li is like me. And that's what the book's, it's the story of Adam. So if you get that, then, then you can study and throw all the pieces you want in there. But that's the story of Adam's life and how Adam messed up, his lineage messed up. And then Jesus Christ came and his name was Adam too, only he was Adam number two, Adam, the second Adam, and he's also the last Adam. He's the second one to come along, but he's the final one. And he then becomes a new race of people from a new Adam just like we started with one, now we got another one, and history starts over again with Jesus and goes on. And now you understand that. You read the first Adam, second Adam. Now you understand the Bible a lot better. Don't get so confused. Yeah, you know, there's so many books written, so many things, and you, know, you go into a Christian bookstore and there's all these like old commentaries and different things. And obviously, you know, you're a man who studies and uh, has a library and you know uses a lot of training resources and um, Talk about that a little bit. I mean, well, uh, people ask me that a lot. I use uh, scholars, commentaries, people that have done great studies. I don't usually use it to get the content. I do use it to get the context, and I get it to make sure that I haven't been uh, duped by a preconceived idea that there's a word that that's an Eng been made in English, and I think I know what that word means. So I go back and let these other people, I want to make sure that my thinking is in line uh, so that I don't get caught later that somebody comes and says, well, you said it means this, but I looked it up and the Greek word says it actually meant that. 
So what I use it for is not so much to get my messages from, but to double check my history and my wording. And I'm very blessed to have had it that it, I almost always check out with scholars and Greeks. I almost always check out, but I do double check that. Uh, when I was younger preaching, there's not too many times, but there are some things that you, you know, you preach and you do, and then you go back later and realize I was a little off. Then I, I presumed I knew the language, especially King James. You presume and you take a line out of the King James and you preach it as a big, uh, as a big, big thing. You know, this is my big moment. And you realize that's not what the original even said. Uh, and there's so many, many. David encouraged himself in the Lord. Yeah, there's so many, many King James things that we know that meant one thing at one time, and we think we know what they mean. So I want to make sure, even in NIV, that I go back and check it. And then, as you know, we I, I love uh, the Erdman's publishing because that'll upgrade you a little bit. And I'll read just about anything they do just because I know it's good scholarly, checked out people. And what are Hendrix, how, Hen, uh, Hendrickson. Hendrickson, I like them pretty well yeah. as publishers. And then anything that by James Dunn, Gordon Fee, N.T. Wright, uh, Craig, Keener. Craig Keener, he's a new, not really new one on the scene, but uh, come along. Craig Keener is really, really good. Uh, ben Weatherington. I like Ben Weatherington uh, pretty well. I use, uh, He's got a lot of social, he's got some books that kind of explain social things, so does Keener. Uh, the uh, books, Manners and Customs of the Bible, is that by uh, Bruce... Uh, well, I don't remember, I can't remember that guy's name, but manner, any, any books on manners and customs of the Bible, some of them are pretty uh, beginning, on the beginning level, but you know you need to begin. So you need to read those things, read those writers, and then get a good commentary. I don't think, uh, what is it, the Matthew? Uh, uh, Matthew Henry? Yeah, I, I wouldn't have, and a lot of people have those because they're available. The Matthew Henry commentary is yeah. so outdated. You need to get uh, people, and people that believe uh, a little wider scope. You probably don't want to get a commentary that is promoting the reformer, the the Reformation uh, philosophy that of the power ended with apostles and it's not for today. All that you need to get beyond that. I like a lot of the scholars that are being written now. They're they're not doing an agenda so much. They just sort of lay everything out there, and then you got to figure out. Well, uh, I read one good one that said, you know, Luke writes and believes that that God never intended for the Holy Spirit to ever end, ever. Never, ever, ever. It's here, but then when Jesus consummates the kingdom of God and that, it's going to still, it's the same Holy Spirit. It's not ever changed. Never a day when it would end. Well, that was a good scholar. Now, if that scholar comes to our church, is he going to be comfortable with everything he sees in our church saying, hey, this is exactly what I said. I said the Holy Spirit work's not going to end, and they're doing it. No, he'll go like, oh, I'm uncomfortable with this. It's loud and intense. But he still said it right. And so then I apply it and say, well, that means I can probably still do it and I can back it up by his good scholarly work. So I back up what I do, though they don't do it. Uh, they, they actually said it right. What's that other guy that wrote so many great things on revival, but I like reading him, but he never experiences it. Martin Lloyd. Um, D. Martin Lloyd-Jones. Yeah. Martin Lloyd. What is his name? Uh, D. D. Martin Lloyd-Jones. Yeah. Jones. Jones. Great writer. Uh, but he never experienced it himself. But he, he's got great principles, so I can, I can read him, and, and he validates what I'm thinking, but I'm going to go do it. Obviously, uh, encountering the Bible is not just a mental exercise, not just a, you know, a mind, you know, study thing, if you will, but it's, it's also spiritual. It's involving, you know, deeper reality of God's outworking. Uh, how do we allow the Holy Spirit to better color our understanding of the text? Make the Bible come alive for us. Yeah, I uh, pers- I'll just all I can do is go personally on this. Personally, for me, I try to release myself of any agendas where I'm trying to prove a point ahead of schedule. I have a point I want to prove, so I now I, all I need is an audience to prove it to. I, all I need is a congregation. I got a great point. I don't go that way really. I like to look at the people I'm going to talk to and say. Uh, how can I help them? How can I move them to be a little, be more like Paul, to want to go for, go, 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 sacrifice more, to know Christ even in a greater way. And so I don't do it that way. I try to let the Holy Spirit, what do these people need? 
Where are they? Now, I may not know those people. I might be going to a church I've never been to before. So I have to think, okay, I've never been to this church before. I can pretty well figure out where they are if it's a charismatic, Pentecostal, full gospel, word of faith, whatever it is. I know about where they are because I've just been around it. And I know that they're going to struggle getting to the next level. They're going to struggle because they've mixed humanism with Christianity too. So they have created, even if they're word of faith people, they love the word of God. They've still mixed it with humanism. So now they're in a comfort zone with where they are. Pentecostals who used to be Pentecostals and speak in tongues and go for signs and wonders, they've found a comfort. They're, they're sunk because their humanism has said, but make sure you're comfortable first. So I already know that. So they're not going to be comfortable going to another level. So I think ahead of time, how am I going to get them there? I have to convince them that it's worth and right, not just worth going for Jesus, that it's scripturally right, and that if we were in the first century, we'd be doing it. So I, I take a scripture then that I like or that I think maybe I would use, and I'll read it and read it and read it. Maybe I'll do just a little bit of background check, like we said. History, what was going on there? What was going on in that city in Corinth or whatever, or Ephesus? Oh, yeah, they're a big, uh, they're a big shipping place, or they have a lot of garment factories there or whatever, you know, and put all that together. But anyway, then I'm going to close the Bible, and I'm going to close out everything, and I'm going to let the Holy Spirit, I'm going to think and meditate and think, Holy Spirit, get this into me. I need to get this into me. And how can I get it into them? And for me, it's like uh, if I get that moment, everything just opens up and the whole concept of what I want to say comes to me in a, in a package. Then it takes me two or three hours maybe to undo this package and write it down in such a way that, it, that I can get it across to somebody else. But it comes to me in a package because I just close out. Now I'm just going to concentrate on that word and the application. And I'm in it. And I'm first century. And then I'm sitting in that congregation. I'm first century. And I'm sitting in that congregation. You know what they're going through. You know what they've been told. And who have they been listening to? And, and yet they want to go more for God, but they're afraid. That's going to be the first. They're afraid. They're afraid I'm going to trick them. They're afraid. They're suspicious of me. So I'm going to go in there and I'm going to talk about this or that. And I'm going to tell a story and I'm going to let them know. And then I'm going to lead them. And my goal then is really probably clear down at the end when I've got them where they trust, they're happy. I've got to break the news to them that they really need to make this cost them more and it's going to be worth it. They really need to go for this. So that's how I think in terms of text and everything is I'm, it's all an application in some ways, but I'm making them human beings, and and I'm not trying to go in and prove to them that women ought to be preachers or women shouldn't be preachers or prosperities of the devil or prosperities of God. These tiny little issues, and I'm going to use up the whole evening or the whole sermon to just a little issue. I'm going to let them, I want to give them a whole lifestyle. Why is prosperity of God? Because his whole his whole heart is I want to take care of JD. I want him to do well. I want him to be healthy. I don't want to hurt him. I, I, I want him to follow this and go for the very best. I, I, now, if he messes this up, then I'm going to go to him a little differently, and I may talk to him a little sterner. But if he doesn't, I'm just going to continue. So, you know, I make him into people. I make God into God. And now I'm going to try to figure out a way to bring this to life to him. So I close it and meditate on it. And then after I realize I'm going, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm going in circles, in my head, after a while, I'm saying the same thing over and over and over. I said, you know what? If I write this down now and make a little notes, I'll know it's there and I won't keep thinking about it. And now I can go to the next point or something else. Mm -hmm. That's good. I, I really want to take some time to even continue to develop this, this line of thinking a lot more from you because I think it's easy to get caught up either in the, you might say, the scholarly or the textual studies, or it's easy to get caught up and we're just going to pray and have some kind of prophetic insight mm -hmm and really the balance between the two and have the two working hand in hand. And I mean, I think you've got a lot to, to say about that. And I still have found if you use fads or you like humanism or the late, you read the latest headline and you're going to try to jumpstart the people by reading the headlines of today or whatever, there's sometimes that works and sometimes it's important, but people respond to the word of God because it's living. 
So make, make it your tool. And everything else is maybe just a little addition here. It can be funny or it can be an application, but don't go to the headlines, read about a war or an earthquake or a collapse. And then that's what you're going to make people be their response point. Respond because God's right. God's word is forever. It's eternal. It's always right. And I want to do the word. So I, I put the word in there and make people respond to the Bible. And responding to the Bible is the strongest thing. Once they do that, you really got them responding. Yeah. Which brings us to another great question here. Um, how, how would it change? What would happen in the earth today if the church worldwide would really do a better job of reading their Bibles, really grabbing this core, grabbing these truths? What, what, would, what would happen to us today? Well, we're, we're really, really symptoms of poor preaching that's poor study and has a secret agenda behind it. Uh, you know, if you belong to a denomination, I'm not against denominations, but so much of it is trying to maintain the denominational flair or, or their particular sidebar of what they are and who they are. You know, I uh, was explaining to somebody the other day about, uh, went to, uh, thank you, um, sat down with a guy that belongs to Seventh-day Adventist, you know, and the great ideas, one talks about Jesus and everything, but mm, couldn't last five minutes before he's going to prove to me that I should be going on the seventh day. So he could not get away from doing that. Well, that's so tainted. He's coming in with such an agenda or that he had to do that. Well, for us, it was a good thing. I say, well, we go on, we go on Saturday anyway. So I go, we go pick your day, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. We go four days a week, five times or whatever. So we're good. But, you know, then you go, you don't realize you're sitting in a church where the denomination is trying to stand for an agenda because they're afraid people are going to leave their church and go over to that charismatic church. And they're afraid and they worry about it. It's going to cost them money. So they're going to drill and drill and drill the tongues is of the devil. Prosperity is not for today or, uh, or you know, it's a counterfeit. You got to be counterfeits, counterfeits, counterfeits. They'll drill you. Uh, over and over until you're afraid to move because they're actually trying to keep you there under their thumb. Once you realize that, then you're going to say, well, then I'm not going to get the life of God because I'm being manipulated. So the the first thing I you have to realize is that's what's going on. If we would stop that and preach the word, just like these Scott, let the pieces fall. If they fall and I realize, you know what, I've been preaching that the Antichrist is coming out of the sea and you better watch out because it might be any moment now. And all of a sudden I go, you know what? I'm not sure that the Antichrist is coming out of the sea. Maybe he, ought, maybe he is Nero. Maybe it was the, the leader of Rome. Maybe so. So now I'm just going to preach it as, as it comes down, as the scholars say, as the word says, as the word text says. I'm going to let it fall where it falls. And if I have to go, oops, then I'm going to do it because when it comes down that way, it starts being life, health, a lamp unto my feet. And all of a sudden, the lights, my light's going to come on. My life's going to come together. I'm going to set my priorities. And the, and the blessings we all talk about so much really will start flowing, but it's in context of who God is. God's center. I'm not center. The word is center. My word is not center. So we have to understand how, how tricked we really have been for an agenda and then read people, and that's what I like about what we do here. I'm not trying. I'm trying to not have an agenda to manipulate people to hold them back. I'm trying to get them to go. And if I turn out that I preached something goofy years ago, I just say, you know what? I the reason I was goofy is because I didn't study. I didn't study my word. I I repeated what I heard, and it sounded good, and it made people laugh, or it made people happy, and it made more money. I should have studied it myself. Mm -hmm. I think what you're saying here basically is better Bible reading just going to give us revival or a bigger breakthrough. Am I hearing that? I mean, yeah, and individually I think is important because it opens the heavens to you. You're not trying to prove that I'm okay, so I'm going to find all the scriptures that says I'm okay and that God's grace covers us and God's grace is sufficient for me. So I'm studying all that stuff because I want to prove to me that I'm okay the way I am and I don't need to do anything. You know, well, you've got an agenda and you're going to be stuck. But instead, it's just... You know, rip your heart open and say, God, I need to know who you are. I need to see myself through the light of the word of God. And 
And however I turn out is how I turn out. But that's I'm going to be truthful in you, your truth already. So that's what I do, and I do it all the time. And if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. If I see something and I get I get convicted, uh, I'll probably get up and go apologize to Kathy or the church or somebody right away. Says I shouldn't have had that attitude, but I was basing it on something I thought it was okay, and I realize it's not. Yeah, it's, it's life, you well, know. It's life. It's the word of God. That's good. Yeah. Do you have any final thoughts on keeping the word of God fresh and continually before us? It's kind of your closing. I hinted to it a little bit is uh, with me, I'm always trying to use it as the book of clues to give me a clues because, you know, as much as we don't like the thought of it, we like to feel like Jesus is our best buddy, best friend, best brother, best bro, you know, and God's our daddy. The Bible clearly says that this thing's enshrouded in mystery and there's the mysteries of the secrets of the kingdom of God and God reveals things to secrets to his children. So, uh, we have to realize these are not going to happen obviously. If they're obvious, they wouldn't be se secrets. There's not a mystery. And God just doesn't throw out everything cheaply to everybody. And so it's so valuable to dig in and go for it. And like I said, not try to have an agenda, but you're just trying to use the book, like I do, of clues. How can I help that person decide that they're going to be better off being a covenant person, committed, community, uh, integrity, and if necessary, sacrifice. Yeah. How can I convince them that that's the way they were, but it's a better lifestyle here? So I got to go to the book of clues for me, and I got to find a scripture that says, if you'll do this, God will be faithful to do that because he did it then, he'll do it again. You know, we, we've heard of your fame, oh God. We've seen, we've heard of your deeds. Now, renew them in our day. We want to see them. Okay, so is the fact that I'm not seeing signs, wonders, miracles, the fact that God has stopped doing them? Or is it the fact that I don't think like an apostle, like a first century, I don't think like Peter, I don't think like Paul, I'm trying to get out instead of in, I'm distracted, I'm carnal, I'm lazy. Is that the thing that's stopping God from giving his treasures. Well, I come back and say, well, I think that's what it is. So now I got to open this book of clues because I got to tell people, if you want them, here's some things you can start with. And it'll never end. There'll always be something else. But that's what I look for. Oh, I found something the way they thought when they read that scripture and it opened up. So I try to find that thought. Uh, so I make it as a book of clues. And I think if you'll do that, um, uh, always trying to help people. I, I we, remember we did that on reading the Bible one time, and I said, I really don't read the Bible for myself anymore. Yeah. I read it for kids, for you, for the network, for the church, for leaders all over the world, yeah. trying to find how have we been blinded by ourselves and what's the clue to the next thing that we can do. And if we do it, because we do things, God's going to respond to us. Draw near to God, he'll draw near to you. What could I do to to open this up where God starts being who he is again yeah. to us. And that's revival. God's being who he is because I'm being who I am. Supposed that's to good. Be. Yeah. Well, I know there's so much more we could talk about. There's a lot. but I'm hoping to have some other conversations with you on a few of the things that we brought out here. But uh, I know this is something that the uh, people that are listening to this and watching it are going to really benefit from. Uh, I might add, too, one other thing is uh, a, a thing that I saw years ago is people that start getting into this word and Bible study and all that is to then get up and want to prove what a scholar or how knowledgeable or how they know what people, other people don't know. And that's such a trap because you're eventually going to come to your peak of how much you know. And sometimes you start making things up or trying to make pieces fit that don't fit. And it gets a little weird because you're actually portraying who you are up there and you want people to admire you and think you're smart and you want to impress them with your Bible study. Oh, what a trap that is. Yes. You know, you're there to help them love God, want to love God more and serve Him more. And you use the word to do that. And so you don't want to do this, all this, get all those books to prove how scholarly and smart you are now, because that's a trap that doesn't work on either end. That's good. Such great. Yeah, insights. we got to do it for everybody else. That's good. Well, I know we're going to look forward to hearing more from I hope you, it helps. Pastor Steve. Blessings. Thanks.